the more disturbing and unanswered questions of World War II is why the death camp known as Auschwitz-Birkenau, or simply Birkenau, was not bombed in 1944 when it could have been. We couldn't understand how people, the Germans, and all their uh, friends, the collaborators, could kill people and nobody is helping us. At the height of the war, the Nazis, using the worst killing machine in history, were gassing and cremating over 10,000 people a day. By 1944, it is estimated that close to one million people had been murdered in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Considering the vast bombing campaign in Europe, could Allied forces have directed any of their air power to the destruction of the crematoria at Birkenau or to the rail lines leading to the camp? More important, should they have? What prevented the Allies, and especially the Americans, from responding to this evil was it a lack of understanding, military resources, indifference, or willful evasion? Would such a military diversion have affected the war effort in any appreciable way? To answer these questions, we must begin by examining what the Allies knew about the ongoing genocide and when they learned of the existence of gas chambers and crematoria at Birkenau death camp. The Allies at the very top knew. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. And all of those people who have been pretending uh, that uh, Roosevelt or Churchill were up in some area where they looked down upon the grand picture of the war and didn't know about this are simply lying. By November 24th, 1942, the State Department had received adequate information that there was no question that this was occurring. Rabbi Wise uh, and several other Jewish leaders with some difficulty got an appointment with uh, President Roosevelt on December 8, 1942. They brought with them a 20-page report uh, of putting together the various informations they had received on the mass murder. And it was called uh, blueprint for extermination. They handed this to Roosevelt and he said, I don't need to read your reports. I know what's in them and it's worse even than what's in your report. The 20-page report handed to President Roosevelt entitled Blueprint for Extermination revealed the existence of the death camp near the Polish town of Oswiecim, better known by its German name Auschwitz. Now that's very significant because it means there's no question that President Roosevelt knew from December 8th, 42 onward that the Holocaust was happening. Centers have been established in various parts of Eastern Europe for the scientific and cold-blooded mass murder of Jews. The slaughter of trainloads of Jewish adults and children in Great Crematoria at Oswiecim near Krakow is confirmed by eyewitnesses in reports which recently reached Jerusalem. This information was buried on page 10 in the New York Times two weeks earlier, on November 25th, 1942. Jewish officials in Europe uh, compiled information about Auschwitz-Birkenau. The Polish underground got a wealth of information about operations uh, at Auschwitz. From eyewitnesses at Ultra, the British code-breaking operation, the Allies actually had information on some of the crematoria before they were even completed. During 1942, the British intercepted decodes. The coding was done by the sophisticated German enabling machine, which the SS and the concentration camp hierarchy used. I have seen uh, some decodes indicating the construction of a huge crematorium at Birkenau. So there was some information available from decodes directly. The killings at Auschwitz and Birkenau were not a secret to the West. On August 27, 1943, reacting to new reports of transports of Jews being killed in gas cells at Auschwitz, the chairman of the British Joint Intelligence Committee, William Cavendish Bentinck, wrote, the Poles, and to a far greater extent the Jews, tend to exaggerate German atrocities in order to stoke us up. 
Incredibly, Cavendish Bentinck's dismissal of the facts came eight months after the Allied Declaration of December 17, 1942, condemning the German government's intention to exterminate the Jewish people in Europe and denouncing in the strongest possible terms the bestial policy of cold-blooded extermination. The Allied statement of December 17, 1942, in which the British and American governments and other Allied governments for the first time recognized formally a Nazi policy of extermination of the Jewish people. First clear-cut recognition and uh, public expression by the Allied powers that the Jews were being mass murdered. In early 1944, a number of circumstances combined to make bombing the Birkenau death camp and the railways leading to it from Hungary critically important and militarily feasible. By May 1944, American and British air forces, which had been operating from southern Italy since December 1943, reached full strength and started pounding Axis industrial complexes in central and east central Europe. For the first time, Allied bombers could strike Auschwitz, located in the southwestern corner of Poland. The rail lines to Auschwitz from Hungary were also within range. On March 19, 1944, Admiral Nicholas Horthy, the regent of Hungary under pressure from Hitler, installed a fascist government. The new political situation meant that 800,000 Hungarian Jews were now in mortal danger, although they did not yet know it. We didn't know we were going to Auschwitz. They, they, they lied to us. We were, the lie was that we were going to be resettled to, to, work, to, to work camps. When we came to Auschwitz, this was the end of anything that we knew. We were very, we were shocked with what we saw. We got off the train. Um, I asked a German uh, SS, a man, I asked, what's burning up here? What's this flame? I asked, I was 13 years old, and he said, this is an Eisen fabric, an iron uh, factory. Later on I found out it was the crematorium. They were burning people day and night. Oh, yeah. My oldest sister wouldn't let my, uh, my mother's arm go. And she said, this is my mother, my mother, and she wouldn't let her go. And they were hitting her. Let her go. You go with the young ones, and she goes with the older ones. And I remember when they were hitting her, my mother went. <sighs> That's how I remember my mother last time. That was it. And then they took them, and they gassed them. My relatives were burned. Oh, my. Um my grandmother, my uncles, my, uh, my, uh, my cousins, my, uh, my, whole, my entire family went up in smoke. All our people, all, every woman in this camp, wherever I was, was waiting for the Allies to bomb, even if we would die. The Polish underground managed to get a number of people close to the uh, camps at Auschwitz and Birkenau and some of those agents and informants came out with very detailed accounts of how many people, how many prisoners had been brought into the camps, what methods of uh, killing and torture were being used in the camps. On March 21st, 1944, two days after the fascists took power in Hungary, the Washington Post published a report from the Polish government in exile in London stating, Poles report Nazis slayed 10,000 daily. The report confirmed that more than 500,000 persons, mostly Jews, had been put to death at a concentration camp at Oswiecim, southwest of Krakow. The report also stated that three crematoria had been erected inside the camp to dispose of 10,000 bodies a day. There were two errors in the report. There was a fourth crematorium, and by March 1944, 
it is estimated that close to a million Jews had already been killed at Birkenau. On March 24, 1944, five days after the Nazis installed a puppet government in Hungary, President Roosevelt spoke in a press conference. What he said was reported on the front page of the New York Times. In one of the blackest crimes of all history, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. He acknowledged that the Jews in Hungary are now threatened with annihilation. All who knowingly take part in the deportation of Jews to their death in Poland are equally guilty with the executioner. This was two months before they were deported to the death camp. In the seven weeks between May 15th and July 7th, 1944, 440,000 of these Hungarian Jews were killed in Birkenau. The issue of bombing Auschwitz did surface in 1944. Requests for military intervention were made by Jewish groups and the Czech government in exile in London, but their call went unheeded. What could have been the Allied justification at that time for not taking any action? The response to, to the request to bomb Auschwitz and all that comes back from the, from the Americans is that we're trying to end the war as soon as possible. By ending the war as soon as possible, we end it for everyone sooner and we save everyone's lives. Roosevelt's consistent answer to the Jewish leaders was the way to save the Jews is to win this war as quickly as possible. And anything that stood in the way of winning this war, including any effort to try to stop the Holocaust, would be counterproductive. In response to requests for military intervention in June 1944, the Operations Division of the United States War Department, OPD, ruled against the proposed bombing, stating that the suggestion was impracticable because it could be executed only by diversion of considerable air support essential to the success of our forces now engaged in decisive operations. This language was adapted by United States Assistant Secretary of War John J. McCloy in his July 4, 1944 response to a request for military action. On August 14, in response to yet another bombing request, McCloy again restated OPD's rejection. He added that after a study, it became apparent that not only was such an operation a diversion from decisive operations elsewhere, but that it was of such doubtful efficacy that it did not warrant the use of our resources. There was no such study. The study's been hunted for. There is no such study in the files. Assistant Secretary of State McCloy said no. We're not going to get into this. There was no detailed investigation of the logistical feasibility of such a raid. To date, no historian has uncovered any such study. McCloy seemed to cut things off. There was nobody above McCloy who restarted them. The most logical place to have conducted such a probe into how Birkenau could have been bombed would have been in the Mediterranean theater of operations, the closest Allied air bases. This was never done. General Ira Aker, the theater commander of Allied Air Forces in the Mediterranean, was not consulted on the issue. In a letter dated April 11, 1977, General Aker wrote, I do not recall that General Spatz inquired of me as Mediterranean Allied Air Forces commander regarding the feasibility of bombing the Auschwitz camp. I was not aware at that time of any mass killings at the Auschwitz camp. To the best of my memory, no one ever suggested that the 15th Air Force or any other unit under my command engage in bombing any of these camps. If a study had been conducted, it would have revealed that Allied intelligence personnel at the operational level in Italy knew of the location of what they believed to be a large slave labor camp. They were unaware it was a death camp. Information at the top had not filtered down. This target chart, given to air crews for the August 20th and September 13th Allied raids on the IG Farman oil plant, shows both Birkenau and the oil plant five miles away. In fact, air crews on missions to bomb the oil plant were briefed to avoid hitting the camp area.
On our mission briefing, when we bombed the area near at Oswiesen, we were specifically warned to avoid the slave labor camp. We, we wanted to avoid hitting the camp because had we hit it, we would have killed what we thought would be many innocent people. John McCloy, U.S. Assistant Secretary of War in his August 14th letter, also erroneously states that Allied bombers were involved in decisive operations elsewhere. As part of the American and British plan to destroy German oil plants, the area around Auschwitz was literally a hotbed of Allied bombing at the time of McCloy's letter. Nearby oil plants at Zerbinia, Chekovitz, Lechama, Odertal, Bohumen, Drohovitz, and Moravska Ostrava were all hit in August. The IG farm and oil plant at Auschwitz was hit on August 20th, just one week after McCloy wrote about decisive operations elsewhere. 126 American heavy bombers struck Auschwitz. Well, elsewhere, how far away? Elsewhere, five miles to those gas chambers. And that's not the only instance of, well, uh, the plain words lying, uh, we'll say disingenuousness involved in the, in the overall picture. In Great Britain, Winston Churchill, at the request of Jewish agency officials Chaim Weizmann and Moshe Shertok, had earlier approved a bombing mission against Birkenau. In a memo to Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden, dated July 7, 1944, Churchill wrote, Get anything out of the Air Force you can and invoke me if necessary. The implementation of the mission fell to Norman H. Bottomley, the British Deputy Chief of the Air Staff. Unlike McCloy and the U.S. War Department, the necessity of conducting a comprehensive target study was acknowledged by Bottomley in a memo dated August 2, 1944. Bottomley wrote, I have discussed this subject with General Spatz, who is most sympathetic. Before we can consider any action, however, it is necessary to know more about the precise location, extent, and nature of the camps and installations at Birkenau. It is particularly necessary to have some photographic cover. The response came the next day from William Cavendish Bentinck, the same intelligence official who in August 1943 wrote that reports of German atrocities had been exaggerated. He wrote that unless the air staff can be given an exact pinpoint of this camp, the airmen will experience difficulty in finding it. What he said was simply not true. From our altitude of 25 to 30,000 feet, if we were asked to locate a large installation, it wouldn't be difficult to do. And even if we weren't sure of it, we would take pictures. We had enough film to take pictures and targets of opportunity. The idea that uh, uh, the, uh, the air crews were not accustomed to looking for uh, unique signatures uh, on the ground, uh, that, that's preposterous. If we had, for example, been told that it was in this area, we would have photographed the area. The reconnaissance planes would take photographs in sequence in a run, and it would go back and forth several times. So you covered with the six-inch fo focal length, 72 square miles in each print, you covered a lot of ground. I would have said that an exact pinpoint was not necessary. It would have been enough to say that this death camp is on the edge of whatever town it was. Uh, these things certainly would be uh, easily spotted from the air and photographed. I think it would have been a routine photographic sortie. In fact, the British Foreign Office, where Cavendish Bentick was a senior official, had already received the full report of two Auschwitz escapees, Rudolf Verba and Alfred Wetzler. The Verba Wetzler report, which had been widely publicized in England and Switzerland, detailed the deportations to the camp the killing process at Birkenau, and its exact location, precisely three kilometers from the town of Ostiechu. Yet this senior intelligence official claimed total ignorance of the death camp at Birkenau. Eventually, Churchill's approval to bomb Birkenau was abandoned. Again, for reasons that remain unclear, foreign office officials simply refused to give the British Air Ministry the target information it requested. There is no indication that Churchill ever followed up 
on his initial approval to bomb Birkenau. The Auschwitz area was certainly within range of Allied photo reconnaissance aircraft. As early as October 1942 and again in August 1943, British planes obtained photographs of the oil refinery at Blechhammer, just 47 miles from Auschwitz. In early 1944, the industrial plants at Auschwitz came under Allied scrutiny after a debriefing with a Belgian prisoner who had escaped from the Farben oil plant the previous May. To confirm the escapee's detailed report of synthetic oil and rubber plants, the first Allied photo reconnaissance mission to Auschwitz was flown on February 26, 1944, but the pictures were unusable due to cloud cover. We were briefed to photograph the Auschwitz area on the 26th of February, 1944. My navigator, Alistair Roger, and I did actually photograph it. On April 4th, the oil plant was re-photographed, the photos revealing more information than was ever intended. The photos revealed for the first time Auschwitz I, the main camp. On the other side of the marshalling yard, the SS quarters are visible, as is the first row of barracks on the eastern edge of Birkenau. Beginning in early 1944, the Auschwitz area came under constant aerial surveillance not because of the death camp, but because of the necessity of bombing the oil plant, which was part of the German oil industry. The South African photo reconnaissance pilot, Charles Barry, who flew the April 4th mission, wrote that he and his two tour navigators became so used to the area that we could find our way around it without a map. Of the three major camps that made up Auschwitz, Auschwitz I, the main camp, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, and Auschwitz III, Buna. Birkenau was by far the largest. The four crematoria were situated along Birkenau's western periphery, a clear and accessible target. On May 31st, the entire camp at Birkenau was photographed. Further photo reconnaissance missions were flown on June 26th, July 8th, August 9th, and August 12th. On August 20th, the Farben oil plant was bombed. In those days, you did have the information, and, and it could have been done. It was all there. This means that by August 3rd, the date of Cavendish Bentig's memo expressing skepticism in locating Birkenau, detailed photos of Birkenau were available in Allied film libraries. However, nobody looked. And if they did, they looked away. Having possession of such photos was a preliminary step. The more critical question was, would it have been possible to locate Birkenau and to pinpoint the exact location of the four crematoria within the camp? The Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, area was, was an enormous uh, place. And it wasn't small, and uh, that could have been easily spotted from the air. Any trained interpreter who uh, is told what to look for or told about the existence of such a camp would find immediately, it wouldn't take him 15 seconds. You use a stereoscope, uh, you use two prints. There was overlap. You take the two prints and put them down and then you look through this stereoscope. It would uh, fuse the images and you would see it in, in 3D. So if you were looking for, uh, uh, for smokestacks, uh, those, those snap out. Uh, real easily while you're doing the, uh, the search area. You'd certainly be able to pick out those buildings that had chimneys primarily by the shadows that they would throw. I have no doubt that given the quality of the photographs that we had and the cameras, given, given the expertise of the pilots who flew these missions and the expertise of the, um, of the interpreters, I believe we could have, could have picked out the camp and we could have picked out the essential elements of the camp, including the crematorium. It's large, it's clear, and it's obvious. By August 3rd, there was enough intelligence about Birkenau, as well as high-quality aerial photographs, to have precisely located the camp and the four crematoria. The feeling was, well, you had a bunch of inexperienced photo interpreters and all that. That's a lot of poppycock. By the time, 1944, and we were far advanced in, in terms of our abilities. 
uh, to look at photographs and to extract information. Judging from the ingenuity that the staff planners had in the Air Forces, the British, the Americans, the French, uh, I believe that given the task, they would have found a way to do it. All they had to do was to say, hey, look, we have, uh, we've got some information that something bad is going on in this area, that people are being killed, and uh, could you, would you look and see if you could find it? And I, even with my, no my pr primitive knowledge at that time, I would have found it. There was enough information available uh, by the end of 1942, and certainly during 1943, that um, the Allied governments could have begun to plan for doing something to stop the killing. The tragedy is that there was enough information to provide a target study months prior to the start of the Hungarian deportations in May 1944. Another question that has troubled Holocaust survivors and scholars alike is why weren't the rail lines and bridges to the death camp at Birkenau bombed? This is how they packed us in to the trains. It was crowded. People didn't have any place to even breathe. And of course we traveled I don't know how many hours, but I know it was a long trip and uh, no water, and it was hot. They should have prevented all these uh, trains from going back and forth and taking all these people. And you, how is so many people died? One of the arguments against bombing the rail lines is that it would have been ineffective. The train tracks were easily and quickly repaired. The counter-argument is that while rail tracks could have been easily rebuilt, bridges, viaducts, and tunnels could not have been. Repairing rail lines, not a very long process. I guess usually a day or two. Repairing bridges was substantially longer, and bridges in, uh, in remote areas even more difficult. The 321st Bombardment Group had been trained specifically to do precision bombing on uh, very small targets, but these targets were very significant, uh, be it uh, bridges, uh, be it uh, special cantonments. There were actually five lines or routes for transporting Hungarian Jews to killing center. The main line was called the Presov Kasitsa line. There was a crucial bridge on that line which, if it could be bombed, would, would stall traffic going to Auschwitz for uh, an unlimited time, as long as that bridge could be held out of operation. By early 1944, military planners in the Mediterranean theater of operations understood that bridge busting was the most effective method of rail interdiction. Requests for bombing rail approaches to Auschwitz included specific mention of bridges along those lines known to be used for deportations. The requests went unheeded. Attacking the killing facilities directly was the other military option available to the Allies. What were the operational constraints to destroying the gas chambers and crematoria? And could they be overcome? One of the obstacles was enemy air defenses, which consisted mainly of anti-aircraft guns, smoke screens, and fighter planes. But by the middle of 1944, the German Air Force had been so weakened, it was forced to carefully pick and choose its battles. And on those occasions, when they elected to fight, the Luftwaffe faced allied air forces that were qualitatively and quantitatively superior. In the Mediterranean theater, by the summer of 1944, uh air-to-air -air or aerial opposition is virtually nil. The enemy aircraft had been, had dwindled down considerably. Most of the aircraft, enemy aircraft, were unavailable or, or not around because the Germans had a fuel shortage. We did have one attack on our group of about 20 aircraft in which we lost four aircraft in May of 44. But after that, outside of one mission to uh, Vienna, we saw very few enemy aircraft. 
the Germans had concentrated most of their fighter defenses in, in Germany itself. In fact, Allied bombers striking at the oil plant at Auschwitz on August 20th and September 13th encountered only token fighter resistance. On the August 20th raid, Allied planes faced 79 heavy anti-aircraft guns, 50 of which had only recently been deployed, yet they lost only one bomber out of 127 aircraft. On the September 13th mission, only three planes were lost out of 96 bombers. In both cases, the loss rate was below the average for the 15th Air Force. Another defense against bombers was smoke screens. If the Germans have enough advance warning, the Germans know where the target is, and if they have smoke projectors, the, cover, the target may well be covered in smoke, even if it's a clear day, which will be a, a technical problem for, for bombing accuracy. Here, for example, German smoke pots obscure the oil plant at Auschwitz. However, in the aerial photographs of Birkenau taken during the August 20th and September 13th bombing missions, there were no operating smoke pots defending the death camp, and the smoke screens for the nearby oil plant did not affect Birkenau at all. This clear visibility is evident in one of the more remarkable combat photographs of World War II on the September 13th mission to Auschwitz. Allied bombs are seen here directly over the crematoria as they drop toward the target. Not Birkenau, but the Farben oil plant five miles away. When this bomb was started, of course, the first idea that people had was let them hit the crematoria, let them stop what was going on, let them stop the burning. Suddenly we looked up, we saw the sky was, was the entire sky was like a big mirror. And the mirrors, the, the whole world lit up, you know. We saw the planes flying over all the time. They were making a lot of racket. And we heard bombs falling. The, uh, the earth was shaking, and it didn't matter, it was, it was music to our ears. And we were all jumping up with our hands and happy and trying to see if they can see us, that here we are, please help us. And we didn't even give a thought that this could get right on our head. We were just right on. From successful Allied bombing missions in southern Poland and elsewhere, it is apparent that German defenses, while formidable, were hardly insurmountable. Critics of the bombing of Auschwitz have argued that any high-altitude air attack would have killed many prisoners. Even so, Jewish leaders argued that in reality, they were slated to be killed anyway. Could the four large crematoria have been destroyed with minimal collateral damage to nearby barracks? That was another question that faced Allied Air Command. The answer can be found by examining a mission comparable to the one at Birkenau. An apt model for such a raid was the August 24, 1944 attack on a group of factories adjacent to the Buchenwald concentration camp near Weimar, Germany. I was the aircraft commander of the 401st Group during that mission. And it was a very successful mission. And as you know, the concentration camps were right next to the factory, and they weren't touched. And it was very, very accurate bombing. In order to avoid hitting the concentration camp and killing inmates, air crews were briefed to bomb only under optimal conditions. The briefing on the Weimar mission that the intelligence officer stressed that there were uh, presumed to be a concentration camp next to the factory and that we were to make every effort for precision bombing right on the target and in the confines of the target only. We can see the first groups of bombs dropped from 24,000 feet score direct hits on the factory area. First photographs you see the bombs falling and then more bombs hitting right after that. With above average accuracy four bombardment groups from the US 8th Air Force successfully destroyed the targeted V-weapons factories with virtually no damage to the adjacent barracks in the concentration camp. The high accuracy of the raid is confirmed here by a photo interpreter. 384 inmates who were working in the factory were killed in the raid because the Germans prevented them from taking refuge in the camp 
After liberation, survivors confirmed that Allied pilots tried their best to avoid hitting the camp. During these air raids, the Nazis, the Germans, so used to come inside the camp because the camp, the inside of the camp, was untouched. There was not a single bomb that fell inside the camp. Despite the possibility of killing thousands of nearby innocent inmates, Air Force commanders were confident that they could destroy this factory in the heart of Germany and willingly risk doing so. If they come in on, on a, on a V-weapons plant outside of Buchenwald, it has to be hit for political reasons. You can make the argument that it was a waste of time and resources to concentrate on stopping the V-1 and V-2 rockets and jets from flying against England. Spots is, is violently protest as much as he can as long as he can about having to bomb V-weapons, which are a diversion of force from the main strategic effort. V-weapon components are a very high political target with the British government. What it illustrates is that if they have to bomb a political target, they will do it if they're ordered to, despite whatever the risk, whatever the risk to the, to the surrounding territory. There is no evidence to suggest they could not have done the same at Birkenau. It's a question of what you feel really strongly about and if people had felt very strongly about destroying the death camps, then I think that could have been managed. In terms of accuracy and, and bombing, again, the crematoriums, yes, you could do it with B-17s from 25,000 feet on a clear day. There's no question that they had the capability to bomb uh, Birkenau. The four crematoria at Birkenau, as was the case with the Buchenwald factories, were built adjacent to nearby barracks. Projected bomb patterns indicate that most bombs would have fallen away from the barracks area. To mitigate the possibility of collateral damage, operational planners could have utilized B-25 medium bombers, which were more accurate. Although bombing from lower altitudes would appear to put them at greater risk from anti-aircraft guns, their maneuverability and shorter bomb runs made them harder to hit. The accuracy of medium bombardment was illustrated in the August 18, 1944 attack on Toulon Harbor, a raid that shared some similarities with a hypothetical raid on Birkenau. The invasion of southern France took place on August 15, 1944. The 321st uh, was called upon to take out the battleship Strasbourg and the cruiser La Gossigny. 36 B-25s from the 321st Bombardment Group were assigned to destroy four narrow profile targets. This required uh, precise bombing and uh, we conducted the raid even though we, uh, the target was heavily defended and we encountered a lot of flak. It was ringed by best knowledge I have as 82 anti-aircraft guns around the Toulon Harbor. Despite the extremely intense flak on the bomb run, the bombers achieved direct hits on their targets. They sank the submarine, the battleship was gutted by fires and completely disabled, and the cruiser keeled over on its side. The destroyer had departed prior to the attack. We were very, very fortunate we didn't lose a single airplane or person. The Toulon Harbor Raid represents a model for the destruction of the four crematoria at Birkenau. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, the B-25s could have bombed uh, the, uh, the killing complexes. The four buildings placed approximately each two to about 350 yards apart and then separated by about another quarter of a mile for the other two buildings. Now, I'm not saying that we wouldn't have some collateral damage because keep in mind there's barracks very close to the killing complexes. Three planes per building, uh, you stand a good chance of destroying the building and not straying away so you'd have collateral damage. To me, yes, I think that the B-25 could have been used and would have been effective. Fighter bombers such as the P-38 were also an option. A comparative scenario for a potential bombing mission on Birkenau was the June 10, 1944 low-level P-38 raid on the Ploeste oil refineries in Romania. The distance was almost the same, about 1,250 miles round trip. One of our longest 
missions of dive bombing was uh, to dive bomb the Americano Romano refinery in the Florida Romani area. The heavy bombers had been trying to knock it out for some time, but they put up a smoke screen. They had plenty of time to do it because the bombers took several hours to get there. So West has the, uh, the, the thickest smoke screen in Europe and they can't, they can't bomb accurately through smoke. We decided to take um, P-38s, put a 1,000-pound bomb under one wing and a 310-gallon tank under the other wing. We'd go on over to the area on the deck all the way. When we get to the target, we'd pull up to about six to 8,000 feet and roll in on our dive bombing attack. The aiming points were also distinct targets within a larger complex. If we didn't have good pictures, of what the refinery looked like and which building was a cracking plant and which building was an evaporation plant and so on. We had to know that and be able to recognize it immediately. So our reconnaissance people uh, did a terrific job in getting that kind of information. Ploesti was the third most defended target in Europe, just behind Berlin and Vienna. Yet P-38s of the 82nd fighter group were able to penetrate to the target and hit their objectives. And when I looked down to see the target area, which I was right over, due to the fact that I'd seen these pictures before, I could see exactly that my target I was going after. And it was a big building there with four smokestacks on each corner. Unlike Ploesti, Birkenau was quite vulnerable to a low-level attack. The camp had no light or medium anti-aircraft guns or smoke screens. If these well-trained and experienced fighter pilots could successfully attack Ploesti, could they not also have attacked Birkenau? In the Esprit de Corps that we would have to save those people from being wiped out the way they're wiping them out, every one of us would want to go in there and risk our life to save those people. And I think we could do it. The death camp had it been considered as a potential target, compared favorably with targets that were successfully bombed during the war. That being the case, the more important question is, should the Allies have sent planes to bomb the death camp? The answer to this lies not in any military feasibility assessment that the Allies never made but rather in some determination of what constituted target priority. Spots and Eisenhower, yes, they had the authority to bomb any target in Europe, but we have to put them into context. Spots and Eisenhower are not going to order a, a, a bombing with obvious political ramifications and diplomatic ramifications without checking, without going up the line and saying, we plan on bombing this, is this okay? The scope of the war was so enormous, and uh, no matter how large, the resources used against Birkenau would have been insignificant compared to the entire scope of the war. Less than 1% of the, of the total effort would have been devoted to, this, to, to bombing Auschwitz. I mean, a very tiny percentage. In the great scheme of things, one third of 1% shouldn't make any difference. Was it incompetence, indifference, indecision, disbelief, anti-Semitism? All of these point to reasons that had more to do with the Allied mindset than its military capability. The Jewish issue was for them number six or eight on the hit parade. It wasn't at the top of their agenda. When the people in the War Department realized that they were expected to participate in some way in the question of rescue, there was a strong negative feeling. I don't believe that in the highest levels of the American government or in the Army Air Forces there was deep enough concern with that particular issue. The OPD simply looked at what's our policy on rescue, and the answer when they looked in the file is no, we don't participate in rescue, and so they negative the request. The Allies had their agenda, and we were not a part of that. Take these strategic bombers and bomb something non-strategic with them, it's going to be resisted because it's a precedent. If, if we can be ordered to take bombers and bomb this thing, who knows you know, what they're going to tell us you know, to, to divert bombers for the next thing. But I do believe that people were telling the truth when they said that they were mainly concerned with ending the war as quickly as possible. But I think they could also have focused on the issues of the death camps if they had been deeply concerned about saving the people in those death camps, and it didn't seem to occur to them. Some military historians, however, 
taking their cue from official statements made during the war, make a simpler case. A death camp was not a strategic target and therefore was a diversion from the war effort. They claimed political and military leaders were not callous or heartless, but rather were determined to focus their air power strictly on winning the war. In the majority, this was true, but there were exceptions. The Warsaw airdrop of fall 1944 is a significant example of when military power was diverted for political reasons during World War II. Allied leaders knew full well that these supplies could not stop the Nazi siege of Warsaw, yet remained resolute in ordering these futile missions. In a humanitarian gesture, the British government ordered a famine relief flight in April 1944 to save 15,000 starving nomadic Bedouin in southern Arabia. The task force consisted of six Wellington bombers with full air and ground crews. These aircraft were pulled from England just six weeks before D-Day. Why couldn't a similar humanitarian effort have been made to destroy the Birkenau gas chambers which were killing over 10,000 people a day. In the United States War Department during the Second World War, there was a Secretary of War, Stimson, and an Assistant Secretary of War, John McCloy, who had a great concern for what they called the artifacts, or what people call the artifacts of civilization. In August 1943, partially because of requests from influential individuals and institutions, the Roberts Commission was formed by an executive order of President Roosevelt. Its mission, in part, was to help preserve cultural, historic, and religious buildings of Western civilization from Allied bombing campaigns in Italy and Germany. With help from the Air Force, which was readily forthcoming, the Commission was able to save many important buildings from destruction. In the 15th Air Force, there were a lot of cultural and, and religious places in, uh, that they very carefully avoided hitting. We were uh, constrained because of so many historical buildings. We were told specifically to make sure not to hit them. The United States prepared an atlas of sites in Italy that were to be, if possible, spared from bombing. McCloy himself arranged for the non-bombing of the German city of Rottenburg, which was also on the target list because of the splendid medieval architecture there. It's an odd paradox that there were people in very high positions who appear in some ways to have been more concerned with saving art objects and other artifacts of civilization or cultural monuments than they were in saving the lives of human beings. The destruction of the killing facilities might have appreciably slowed the systematic slaughter. The four large crematoria took eight months to build at the height of Nazi power. Rebuilding them in the last year of the war would have been nearly impossible. A successful bombing would have slowed down the killing operations, would have made them less efficient. In retrospect, there is no one answer to explain how could it be that the governments of the two great Western democracies knew that a place existed where 10,000 helpless human beings were being killed every day. Knew that such killings actually occurred over and over again, and yet within their effort to win the war, did not feel compelled to try and stop it. The Allies could have done a great deal more to let the Germans know that they knew what they were doing to us. At that time, the, the Germans were, were burning 10,000 men, women, and children every day, every night. That hurts. So if the Allies bomb Auschwitz, this sends a statement to the Germans, we know what you're doing, we don't like it, stop it. It wouldn't have taken away from the war effort, you know. Uh, although you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear people say that it would take away from the war effort. Those are uh, phony baloney excuses, you know. One has to wonder why there couldn't have been the slightest little diversion. You know, there's no voice for the Jews in, 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 uh, 
Allied headquarters. Uh, there's very little voice you know, in Allied politics, not as much. You see, I think that we would have uh, felt that somebody did care if they bombed. It's a sad but true fact that the Allied militaries in World War II were not, were, there were not very many high-ranking Jewish officers in the, in the Allied militaries. And, and, and if there were, they weren't, they were normally inclined to assimilate. They were normally inclined not to speak out and emphasize their Jewishness. Why? Because the Jewish community was terrified of homegrown anti-Semitism. I can't find that voice in, in, in the Allied halls of power speaking out for, for bombing Auschwitz, speaking out insistently and speaking out that this must be done. I think the evidence indicates that the, the policy and the mentality uh, were flawed. When will they it, it try to liberate us, to destroy the Germans, to destroy the, the camps? But it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Nobody came. Nobody came. <laughs>